We do have 10 o'clock, so we will convene the uh, Dubuque County Board of Supervisors special COVID-19 meeting, Monday, November 30th, 2020, 10 a.m., uh, being conducted via Zoom and um, at the courthouse uh, fourth floor supervisor's chambers. We'll go to the agenda. So the first item on the agenda is the work session to discuss COVID related issues. And with that, uh, we'll go to uh, Patrice Lambert, director of our Dubuque County Health Department for her report. Well, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Good morning, Patrice. We can hear you just fine. Good morning. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to again start with a dashboard report for Dubuque County. We've had 44,025 individuals tested. We have had, um, let's see here. Oh, it just said that I came. Can you still hear me? Can you hear I me? I can hear you fine. Oh, okay. Okay, it came up. Yeah, muted. I'm sorry. I apologize. Okay, so with that, um, out of the 44,025 individuals tested, we have had 9,209 individuals that have tested positive. We have had 5,855 of those individuals have totally recovered. And unfortunately, we have had 91 deaths in um, Dubuque County. Uh, we do have six, um, long-term care facilities that are deemed as outbreak um, care facilities, that being Shady Rest Care Center in Cascade, Lutheran Manor Communities, Manor Care Health Services of Dubuque, Bethany Home, Hawkeye Care Center, and Dubuque Specialty Care. And I know on Stacy's report, um, she will um, also include that the VNA has been doing individual calls on a daily basis to these uh, long-term care facilities to offer any assistance um, that they do need. As far as our positivity rate for the past 14 day average, um, our number for Dubuque County is decreasing slightly. We are at 16.9%. And then as of, um, let's see, it would have been Saturday, 1128, Dubuque has had 33 residents that have been um, hospitalized, and that could be throughout the um, state of Iowa itself. And then I will um, ask Sam if Sam could put up our PowerPoint presentation. Okay, this we just also again want to share um, with the most current White House report, which again, it comes out basically every either Tuesday evening or Wednesday. And this one did come out on the 22nd. Um, actually, I believe that was last Sunday. But this is just a comparison to show you what the United States looks like from this month to six months before quite um, a contrast when you look at the surge of the COVID um, cases. And Iowa currently ranks number five in the U.S. for the new cases per 100,000 and number 11 in the U.S. for the new deaths per 100,000. So the next slide, Sam. Um, again, in that White House report, they always do give um, updates. And this one is basically Europe is experiencing a fall surge similar to what the United States is doing and is showing early stages of improvement through county specific mitigation efforts. 80% require wearing masks in all public settings. Most um, countries have imposed fines for noncompliance. 93% have significant restrictions on gathering size. 63% have some form of non-essential business closures, initially focused on the bars and reducing that restaurant cap um, capacity. 60% have some form of entertainment or public space restriction. And 65% have developed a contact tracing app. And as you are aware, the governor's um, proclamation for many of these items that are listed here continues through December 10th. So the next slide, please, Sam. 
Um, and again, these are still pretty much the same recommendations that have been um, included in our White House report for probably the last month, if not longer. Again, encouraging people to wear those masks, to follow the um, social distancing, all of our mitigation strategies um, throughout. And again, targeting the testing, um, it does have to ensure um, compliance with the public health orders, including wearing masks. And then it has the new hospital ad, um, admissions in Iowa are increasing across all age groups and investigate the rise in the new admissions in those under 18 years of age. And again, we are continuing to encourage that influenza uh, vaccine. Next slide, please, Sam. And then this is our update for our zip code that we do, as you know, every single Monday morning. It is shared with all of our mayors and our city clerks in the county. Um, this first slide is just showing you the, the blue bar are the cases as of today. The orange bar are the cases as of last week. So you will see that um, with our total cases, we have climbed to 9,090. Our total recovers, recoveries have also climbed. Our deaths, unfortunately, did climb by one since last week. And then our active cases um, have actually decreased um, this for today compared to last week. Okay, the next slide, please, Sam. And this is a comparison, again, of the total COVID cases per zip code. Again, that blue bar are the active cases as of today. And then the orange bar are the active cases as of last week. So you will see we continue to have some zip code towns that um, we have to follow the Iowa Department of Public Health criteria that if it's less than five, we cannot identify. We can only identify by saying that the change is less than five. So we have had um, some of those cities that have been identified of that as well. Okay, the next slide, please, Sam. And this is the total cases. Um, for all of our zip code, just put on a bar graph. And again, I, like I said, we share this with all of our mayors. And then this one is the positive, the percent of the positive cases um, per zip code based on that population size. And this is as of this morning. So you will see that Farley continues to um, increase. Um, and I believe that they have always been the highest um, with a population based on the population with that. The next slide, Sam. Um, we did have Diane Pate Freiberger, the Board of Health member, did ask us about the convalescent um, plasma in Dubuque. So Sam did do some um, checking on this last week. So we will be putting this up on our Facebook page, and we have shared it already with Randy Gale to um, have this information in one of our daily updates that he puts out every single afternoon, um, because this is good information. I don't know how often it is used in Dubuque County, but I do know that um, if you just read with the Mississippi Valley Regional uh, Blood Center, and the American Red Cross, those donations are kept locally to supply our county hospitals. Then the BioLife Plasma, the donations do not stay locally, but they're sent out throughout the um, country. And there are um, basically two criteria. And then the third criteria is if you do wish to donate, um, you do have to be at least 17 years of age but then you have to have had a positive COVID test and be recovered from COVID-19 for those 28 days. So again, this will be an educational push for us to encourage people if you have tested positive to please consider um, donating blood because it may help drastically for a person who is in the hospital who is positive with COVID. The next um, slide, please. Oh, and then our sources and our links. Um, 
we I can also share that one well one of the links that has mask required signs for the business owners. Um, I again have only heard positive from the city clerks with our mask mandate throughout the county. There has been one town that has requested some additional um, masks themselves, but um, I myself and our office have not heard of any complaints um, this past week regarding our new mask mandate. So we really do hope that, um, again, people are abiding by those social um, or by those uh, uh, mitigation strategies because we know that they all work hand in hand. But again, we're really, really encouraging people to please abide by that mask um, required ordinance that we now have because we do know that masks now not only protect the people around you, but can be protecting the person who is wearing that mask. And again, we highly encourage people to go to that COVID-19 dashboard because there's more and more and more information that is being shared um, publicly, especially with the um, hospital information. And then um, our other link is with our Facebook page that Sam does a phenomenal job getting um, information out on a daily basis on our Facebook page for Dubuque County Health Department. So, and that is all that we have. So are there any questions? I can also add, I'm sorry, <laughs> before I ask if there's any other questions, um, we do still do our weekly uh, webinar with the Iowa Department of Public Health um, on our vaccine distribution. And it does sound as though there will be Pfizer for sure um, is requesting to have an FDA approval meeting on December 10th. Once that meeting is over, um, they have been telling us that it will probably take up until December 14th for the FDA to make that clearance or not make that clearance for Pfizer. And if they do make the clearance, then um, Iowa Department of Public Health is expecting uh, doses of the vaccine to start being distributed shortly after. So again, the instant management team has been working with our hospitals, our healthcare providers, our long-term care facilities, so that when we do get that green light and we do have um, vaccines coming our way, we will have our priority groups already identified if they continue to be the healthcare providers and our vulnerable population with a long-term care settings, which we are anticipating that um, that will remain the same so that we can begin to get those vaccines out to the um, appropriate settings. So now I'll ask for questions, sorry about that. Any questions for Patrice? None for me, thank you. None for me. All right, thank you. Thank you, Patrice. Uh, I guess we'll go to uh, Stacy Killian for her report. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Can hear you just fine, Stacy. Good morning, Stacy. Good morning. So um, as Patrice mentioned, our cases are down in the last seven days. Um, we're at 9,241 this morning, which was an additional 584 cases from last week. Um, the previous week, we had an additional 822 cases, so a significant difference. Um, I think a lot is probably attributed to the Thanksgiving holiday, not as many people being tested, the lab not running as many hours as they typically do. Um, so we are anticipating that it may go back up slightly, hopefully not, but we are prepared if it does. Um, as Patrice mentioned, we had one additional death this week, um, and that is down from the 11 deaths we had the previous week. So that's um, good to see that going in the right direction. Uh, we've had a total of 30,255 contacts in the community, and that's an additional 263 calls and contacts we received this past week at VNA. Um, that is also down from 512 the previous week. And again, a lot has to be attributed to the Thanksgiving holiday um, for that. As Patrice mentioned, we had two additional long-term care outbreaks, both Hawkeye Care Center and Bethany Home. We are doing the daily follow-up calls. We have two nurses that um, work with those facilities every single day. 
um, working with both resident symptoms and recoveries, as well as any staffing um, supplies or, or any additional public health mitigation efforts they need inside the facility. Um, as most of you know, Dubuque Community Schools is going virtual this week. We are still doing daily follow-ups with the schools and still reporting any positive or quarantine cases to them throughout the entire week. In terms of VNA staffing, um, we are finalizing our interviews for our two temporary RN positions. We hope to have an offer made within a couple of days um, for both of those positions, and those two RN positions will assist us with the contact tracing and the mitigation efforts, and then also assist us in administering the vaccine when it gets here. Um, we have posted a temporary case manager, manager position to also assist with the contact tracing calls, and that position has been posted, so we will start interviewing as soon as we receive candidates for that. Um, other than that, we had um, a busy weekend. We did make contact tracing calls throughout the holiday weekend with the exception of Thanksgiving. Um, kudos to my staff for willing to work throughout the, the long weekend and over the holidays to make sure that these calls get made, but they have managed to keep up with the volume thus far um, in partnership with our um, with Iowa Department of Public Health. So we are grateful for that, um, and I think it's working out well. So I think that is all I have this morning, unless you have questions for me. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, any questions for Stacy? Thank you, Stacy. Okay, um, we'll move on. Uh, I believe next up is uh, our interim uh, Sunnycrest Manor Administrator, Tammy Freiberger, with the uh, Sunnycrest Manor update. Good morning, everyone. Um, Good morning, Tammy. I have um, for an update for our isolation level one monitoring, we do have two residents in there who had returned from the hospital that require 14 day monitoring post hospitalization just for any signs and symptoms. In our isolation level two that are symptomatic or um, possibly awaiting confirmation of a test, we have one um, in the overabundance of caution, they tested negative on a rapid test that we did for them. But anytime a resident presents with um, respiratory symptoms that doesn't have a definite diagnosis, we need to explore that. And so we, um, we, we do put them in isolation immediately upon presentation of symptoms and continue to monitor. And in our COVID unit, we have zero. Um, testing did occur today and we had zero resident that tested positive. So we are good there. And we have also today had zero staff test positive thus far. Um, we do have um, a staff, two staff that are out that presented with symptoms and we also treat them with the overabundance of precaution and monitor them and continue to do testing for them and wait out their time period. So um, we are monitoring that. And then just uh, interesting FYI, to date we have five cases that were a false positive test, meaning they read positive on our antigen machine, but when we did the PCR, they were actually negative. Um, but we have had more luck identifying those positive people and getting, getting them out of here. So I would say that it, it works in the opposite way, far better than these five cases of false positives. So, and then I think I kind of sent a report, just an FYI of the breakdown um, that I had forwarded the Board of Supervisors, kind of just more specific to our facility. And that's all I have. Tammy and McDonough, I have a question for you. First, yeah. thank you for your report. Um, and for all the work folks doing over the holiday weekend, nobody really gets a break in long-term care. So um, we appreciate you being there. Um, I'm wondering if there's uh, any follow-up happening with the individual we believe has now been tested, has now had COVID for the second time. Um, is uh, the CDC, is anybody following up with us about that? Um, I know that that's a um, highly unusual situation and just wondering, you know, what the workup is of that, if you can share it without obviously violating any, any privacy concerns. So what I did is I contacted Iowa Department of Public Health is who I went with and um, they based it on all the data and the factual information that was provided with regard to the first positive 
date where they tested positive. Um, the fact that they completed their 10 days of isolation, the fact that they reached their 28 days where they could be considered clinically um, completely recovered by Iowa Department of Public Health. And then the fact that a month after that, they presented with symptoms again. Um, I also provided them with the data that we had done two um, rapid tests that had achieved a negative results. And then that month later, they went in and had a rapid test and it tested positive. So according to IDPH, um, they have suggested to us that there's not enough information to determine different resident individuals um, and any individual and their level of antibodies and for how long. So I can tell you that I have some staff who are actually um, donating plasma, plasma. They are doing the convalescent plasma. Um, and they have to be tested every single time before um, they donate to ensure that they still have the level of antibodies. And so I think that it varies. It could be lesser for some people and longer for others. For instance, one staff told me they were able to donate for four and a half months because they were still presenting with the level of antibodies. But I don't know that that would be um, you know, the same for everybody. Everybody would have a different level of immune response um, for their body. So for all practical cases, Iowa Department of Public Health did tell me that they would classify that particular individual as a reinfection, such as that it was a new, new case. Thank you for taking all the extra precaution. And, um, you know, that's the purpose, I think, of all the testing that we're doing is to be um, as careful as we can be. So thank you for the update. I hope that person's um, doing well. Are, yes. are they? Uh, and and back, back to their home village and out of awesome. isolation. Thank you. Hey, any other questions for Tammy? Thank you, Tammy, uh, for uh, the good work that you're doing and, and all the care and concern that you have for our residents at Sunny Crest Manor. You're welcome. Does not go unnoticed. <laughs> we love it here. I know you do. It's not business, but we love it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll go to, uh, for our next report, uh, Tom Berger from our uh, Emergency Management Services, our director. Uh, good morning, supervisors. Um, we're anticipating our first uh, load through the, our PPE distribution through the, the node, which is actually gonna come direct to us this week. So um, starting this week, we will be supplying the Test Iowa clinics and sites um, here with uh, backup out of the Cedar Rapids node. And then the state will remain to keep filling the node in Cedar Rapids. So um, interesting to see how that'll work. And other than that, I really don't have anything uh, additional to report other than what Patrice reported on behalf of the incident management team. Good morning, Tom and McDonough. Uh, nationally, we hear stories, um, and I think you can read at any time about um, extraordinary PPE shortages that the hospitals weren't properly geared up um, over the summer months for the surge that's happening. Um, do you believe that we have all that we need in our county? Yeah, well, I think we're uh, we're sitting pretty good. But like I said, we have not had to supply any of the hospitals anything since they uh, opened back up in May for the elective surgeries. And I believe that's still part of the governor's proclamation that they have to have a good supply and not rely on local or state um, emergency operation centers for for PPE. So I'm hoping, I guess I can't answer for the hospitals, but I, they have not needed to ask for anything locally lately. And on the governor's press conference last week, the, the person who I work directly with on at Homeland Security was on there and he said that they have uh, roughly a 16 to 18 supply of PPE looking at the burn rate that they had through the pandemic. So that's what they're, they're shooting out to the nodes at this time. So I think, uh, uh, to my knowledge, we're doing pretty well here. And what does the county supply look um, like, just for purposes of you know the ones we've distributed to the incorporated areas? Um, 
is there a need for us to purchase additional we, supplies? Is the Board of Health, you know, covering that? Yeah, and I'm uh, at the end of the month coming, we'll be doing inventory this week. Um, but we still have, uh, we, we have not touched the individually wrapped um, masks that we have here. So there's 20,000 of them. And then we have probably another 25,000 of the ones the Board of Health bought, in addition to around 8,000 of the initial ones that the Board of Supervisors uh, bought back in uh, March. So, so for the the public mass, we are uh, we're we're sitting pretty well at this point, and they're short turnaround to get them and when we need them. Yet, uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you. Any questions for Tom Berger? Thank you for the report, Tom. Keep up the great work. Okay, uh, moving on the agenda, testing update. Uh, normally we would go to Ed Raber, but uh, uh, I, I, I don't have anything particularly new for you today, Chair Baker. Okay, thank you. And uh, I, I believe Stacy and, uh, and Patrice kind of touched on it uh, as well. Um, so the, the, I only think the only the only factoid that I would mention is that roughly half of Dubuque County's population has been tested at least once by this point. Okay, thank you. But that has implications, doesn't it? Ed? The fact that already half the population's been tested because we don't get very clear information from IDPH about how many actual tests are being conducted. They are only reporting new people who are tested for the first time. Um, so other than some positive cases that happen in the community that's already been tested. So um, our window of actual counts of tests being done is closing. Um, kind of how I view it is you know, we're going to get less information because more people are likely to be tested for their second and third time. I think it would be, you would expect that the daily number of tests that are reported um, will will continue to, to appear to go down somewhat because uh, out of the sample of people that are tested in Dubuque County, a smaller and smaller fraction of them are being tested for the first time. So um, also for whatever that means, uh, Dubuque County is probably at the top of the, the heap of counties in terms of uh, penetration of testing. There's, uh, there's only one or two other counties out of the 99 that have, that have gotten to half of their population being tested. But this board, and I, I think Supervisor Wickham is to be applauded for this too, um, maybe singled out, has been diligent and forceful about increasing testing and making sure that testing is available. Um, I don't know if we have a concern about this. I mean, maybe we don't today, but it certainly gives me cause to worry because we don't see, we're not going to see the full picture of testing, whether we're meeting, I think our goal as a board of supervisors to have testing be widely available. I mean, we know whether or not appointments are at capacity, I guess, if we if we reach out to those folks, but um, thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, we'll move on. Uh, next item on the agenda is our Board of Health update. And we do have our uh, chairperson of the uh, Dubuque County Board of Health, uh, Tom Bashan, with us today. So, Tom, uh, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Chair Baker. Uh, I would echo what Patrice said earlier that uh, uh, the the mask mandate process seems to be working very well. Uh, we've heard, I haven't heard any complaints about the process, so. I'll take that as an endorsement uh, for what's going on. I do know that uh, there are instances where people aren't wearing masks, but we expected that. But uh, I think we've seen an increase in the number of masks being worn throughout the county. Uh, the only other thing I would add is that uh, 
since the Board of Supervisors meeting started this morning, the agenda for our Wednesday night meeting has been published. We will be meeting at six o'clock this Wednesday evening. Um, and uh, one of the focuses for our session this week is to uh, be ready with a budget for the supervisors as we've done in the past to have that approved by the board by the at the 16th of December meeting. So that is primarily all I've got unless there are any questions. Are there any questions for Tom Beshin from the Board of Health? No. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up on the agenda, updates from Dubuque County municipalities. I know that we have uh, at least one mayor on, Sandy Gassman from Epworth was on. I don't know if Sandy wants to speak or not. Uh, and uh, obviously she's more than welcome to do so. Um, and I don't know if we have any others, somebody might have to help me identify um, if there's any others. And are there any other reports from the municipalities? And hearing none, uh, Let's move to the next item on the agenda. Um, next item is uh, item B. Uh, we have uh, a notice of public hearing in your packet and uh, it's to approve plans and specifications for the jail dormitory renovation project. And if, uh, Someone has a report. I don't know if Sheriff Kennedy's on or not. I can't see the list, so. Um, Dave, this is Don Sherman. I can just give a brief update. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is because of the size of the project, we are required to have a public hearing on the plans and specifications for this project. So. This is approving that uh, notice um, for the hearing to be held at your regular December 14th um, meeting in which you will, as the board, will officially approve the plans and specifications, and then that would go out for bid at that time. Okay, thank you. And this is on the, uh, this is on the um, dormitory renovation project. Okay, and that's scheduled for uh, December 14th, uh, public hearing December 14th at night at our uh, meeting at 9 a.m. on December 14th. Don, right. will, be, will more be published with this? I mean, there's no, it's a public hearing about plans and specifications, but where are the plans and specifications? That will be included in the resolution in which you approve on the 14th. So how do citizens know I mean, you know, I mean, how can they know whether or not they have a concern about the plan and the specifications if we've not published that for them to look at? How are they supposed to get up to date? I would need to check with the auditor because she is the one who's placed this on there um, to see if they have those to share. I mean, I don't think it, anyway, I mean, I don't know. We're just telling people that they're, we're gonna talk about something you know, stay tuned, I guess. Is that really the best we can do? Ian? Yeah, Mary, uh, yeah. good morning. The actual plans and specs are going to be uh, emailed to me. So if anybody wants to look at those, I will be able to send them either by email or um, Joe, Sheriff Kendi will have a set over at the law enforcement center. If anybody wants to look at the plans there. Yeah, the problem is our notice doesn't say that. Oh, this is one work around the supervisor Wickham was that we could do a, a work session next Monday and just have a half an hour or whatever time we think is appropriate and have 
the sheriff and or the architect just explain the plans and at least that way they'd be presented to the public prior to the public hearing. I like, yeah, I like that, Jay. I think that's probably a good idea. Well, it sounds with like we um, deadlines with getting things to the newspaper. If we don't send this to the newspaper until next Monday, the public hearing cannot happen on the 14th. I understand. I, I think what we're saying is, well, I mean, maybe we can proceed with the notice of public hearing, but have still that separate work session so that they're discussed in public. And then at that point, there can be, you know, information um, on the agenda for that work session that says where you can find them for more information. Okay. Let, and this is uh, Supervisor Baker. Let me remind everyone, we did have a work session on this. I agree having a refresher work session is a good idea, but this was discussed in a work session, but uh, some time has elapsed. So I think having a uh, review uh, next Monday for informational purposes is a good idea. And uh, I think we should uh, go ahead and schedule that um, for our meeting next Monday, which would be December 7th. This, today, the order of business is to approve the notice of public hearing, uh, approving the plans and specifications for the jail dormitory renovation project. I'll make a motion to approve the notice of public hearing. Second. Motion made and seconded to approve the notice of public hearing. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Carried 3-0. Okay. Uh, next up is item C, work session with the budget director to discuss FY22 budget process. So with that, we'll go to our budget director, Stella Rundy. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Good morning, Stella. Yes. So uh, we had a work session last week where we started to discuss FY22 budget. And this uh, is a continuation of that after some various questions and discussion. Uh, one of the first things that we talked about was the grant process um, and looking at that process for this year and how we want to treat it. So uh, you as the board had asked me to put some stuff down into writing on the grant process, which I will share now. Uh, Don, can you allow me to share my screen and I'll get that posted? Still, I would have preferred that this be in an agenda packet that would publish for everyone to see. Yes, um, due to the holiday and the short week, it wasn't available for the uh, agenda packet quite when it was published. So I can um, email it out directly to all of you. So you have it, but um, I'll share it now. You should be able to share your screen, Stella. Okay. Can everybody see that? No. How about now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, I won't read through this. I'll send it out to all of you. But basically what we've been doing is uh, we released the grant application around this time of the year, right around uh, the 1st of December, and leave it open for approximately four weeks to allow um, organizations to uh, have time to apply and uh, get those back to me. Then I'll gather them and provide them to the board and compile them into an Excel format. So we have that um, for review. Um, then we schedule work sessions where um, you as the board decide um, which organizations you'd like to hear from. Uh, we don't ask everyone to come in every year to present, um, but if there's particular applications that um, you have questions on, we allow those people to come in and present. And then um, what we have been doing is then reviewing all of the applications at the end to make determinations of what would go into the budget for the next year. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, some alternatives that we've discussed so far would be um, one that we would post the application as usual and gather applications. Uh, you would decide on a total grant funding level in the budget, but not make determinations on uh, each individual application. 
until after the budget is complete. So then the budget would just not exceed the total that you allotted in the budget. Uh, the second one is very similar. It's just that we wouldn't release the grant application now. We would do it at a later date, um, probably more into the spring after budget, um, but prior to year end. And then um, another alternative that was brought up last week was that you would decide on a grant funding level and um, provide that to a not-for-profit organization who would re review and receive the applications and award the grants. And of course, there's always um, what we have been doing. So that can continue this year as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then um, we kind of touched on a purchase of service versus grant and what that means. So I just got some definitions and put those down. Um, purchase of service uh, is basically a contract to obtain uh, health and human services for our constituents. And then a grant um, often refers to a specific project that's funded. Um, so I just put those down so we could, you know, have that for reference as we work through this. Um, I'll share another document quickly here. Share. So I kind of rearranged um, our grants that were made last year into two different buckets. And this is just my first attempt at it, but um, the green represents what I would see as a grant. Can yep. Can you make it bigger, please? Yeah. Sorry, Jay, was that you? Supervisor? Yes, yeah, a little big. You make it, little, yeah. A little bit. Yep. Thank you. Much so, better. <clears throat> okay, perfect. The green represents um, what I kind of categorized as a grant and the pink as a purchase of service. Um, the other colors are what we classified things as last year. So we had asked the applicants to classify themselves under these uh, five categories. So these colors I just left in here to reference what those were, but they don't mean a whole lot um, in particular to this. Um, my thought is that um, the total of the grants was approximately 970,000, purchase of service about 608,000. With the purchase of service, I would like to assign those to a department if they haven't been already assigned to a department, which some have. Um, in particular, the Dubuque County Food Policy Council and the um, lead matching grant funds, those have already been assigned to the health department. So have those um, departments manage these grants for, or these uh, purchase of service for us. Um, we have an economic development department that doesn't have a whole lot in it right now. It's being managed by Auditor Dolan, so we're discussing um, how that transitions um, into either a different staff or uh, continues on with the auditor to manage. Um, but some of these I think would align really well with that department. And then of course, um, the Tom Hancock Memorial Grant with the Emergency Support Services Department. I think that would align really well. So what I would like to determine today is if you would like me to release the grant application, um, I can get that updated and released onto our website and uh, let people know that's out there. Or if you would like to have further discussion on this, um, we can continue honing in um, however you would like on this process. So I'll open it up, I guess, for questions or comments. Stella, how are you going, who are you going to tell that this is open? Um, last year, we did not tell per se anyone. We posted it to our website. Um, I just uh, have been working on our website as well, getting that uh, cleaned up and ready for this year. So I can share that. Um, let's see. I 
actually, I can't, excuse me. I don't see that I can share that web page right now, but um, it is on our Dubuque County website under government and budget. Um, we have our budget web page, so I'll be posting um, things as we go along and keeping this up to date. So we have um, when we have notice of public hearing and our calendar, the calendar is out there now. Um, and as documents are available, they will continue to go out there. So last year, what we did was just po we posted it to our website and applicants found it there. Stella, with, uh, if, if, if we decide to go this direction, would you recommend maybe a little uh, like a press release or something along that order uh, because this would be a, a change and give the um, entities and organizations uh, some information um, and make them aware of this and uh, I don't think it's possible to individually reach out to every organization because we're bound to miss some. And, uh, and I also don't think it's fair just to send it to organizations who got grants or applied last year. So um, I, I would, uh, I, I want it to be fair. Um, and I know there are gonna be folks who say that, well, some of the larger organizations um, have greater awareness of what's going on in the community. I don't know that we can, I don't know that we have a magic wand uh, to help to uh, change that, but uh, I think by doing some public, um, I don't know, if marketing or at least uh, uh, awareness raising um, prior to this. So if your, um, if your timeline for future years is the month of December, maybe for this year, if this is the direction uh, that um, the board decides to go, that we, you know, maybe back it off a week and, and go into uh, the first week of January. And if, if having a full month is, is the goal. So I'd be, probably more interested in hearing from Ann and Jay uh, on their thoughts um, as uh, you know, I'm, I was, uh, um, I, I think having some structure is probably a good thing and I applaud you for your efforts on this. Um, I would, you know, I, I guess I would have liked to have had a chance to look at this and I understand we had an early deadline so, um, I'm looking at it now. I really can't argue with your, um, with what you've, uh, what you've done. Um, one maybe could make an argument on RTA um, as a purchase of service. Uh, um, and, and be put in somebody's budget, but uh, so, but I'm not here to argue about it. I just uh, wanted to, uh, uh, point out that I think if, if we are gonna go this way, we need to give everybody the same opportunity to get the information. That's one of the problems that I have, um, which is <clears throat> giving people information. And also, um, you know, this, this whole process happens very much and it isn't very transparent. We do it in public and that's simply the end of it. Um, that's it's not very transparent and it's, I mean, I still struggle with its purpose, give away a million dollars um, to some organizations who apply to us. Some have applied to us apparently for many, many, many years. Um, you know, I, I think we should go at this from a more strategic point of view, which is identifying um, purpose or specific, especially this year, specific targeted improvements we want to make or um, issues we want to try to address and remedy. You know, as I look down this list, um, several of these organizations have received 
support from Dubuque County through the $400,000 we have given uh, to um, the Community Foundation for um, pandemic relief through COVID. So, you know, that, that raises an issue in my mind that should we be getting those updated numbers as well um, before we give an organization additional funding? Um, you know, I'm not ready to post a grant application because I, I, I think in our budget process, we might be better off putting in a target number that we will not exceed. Um, we'll have a, a, a new supervisor who's gonna be giving thoughts about this I admire that, you know, Dave's not wanting to take too firm a stand maybe on this, but um, there isn't a rush. Um, we probably should spend some time figuring out, you know, the answers to questions I've always had. This has always made me uncomfortable. Um, and I, you know, and, and having this conversation today with information presented through screen sharing is, um, I mean, I don't think it warrants any kind of decision making being done today, even to the point of do you put it on the website or not. I don't know. I think it's the opening point of conversation. Um, and there's not, we can always, we can always put it on the website and ask for people to respond within four weeks. You know, there's others up here that belong in health, Mercy Health Services is just listed as you know, as if we gave $100,000 to Mercy. Well, that was for a very specific purpose. That's the opioid, um, you know, that's, that, that's money to provide substance abuse and opioid um, response to folks who otherwise wouldn't get that access. Um, that should be completely, I mean, that maybe it belongs in health, although the health department doesn't have a committee on substance abuse anymore. Uh, maybe that should be, you know, there's a community foundation brain health initiative. You know, we're looking at kind of a redesign of our disability. You know, we were hiring a director of disability services. Maybe that should be more into that budget um, so that we're getting some departmental oversight and, you know, we're knowing why we're spending the funding and what we hope the purpose is. And then you have a, a department head who's making sure to track if um, we're getting back the things we hope to achieve, any information back, um, I think is is helpful. So, uh, yeah. And I think you're, this is Supervisor Baker, you did raise a, a good point. I, I will point out that this is a work session with the budget director to discuss FY22 budget process. So there would be no action uh, taken today uh, because it's not an action item on the agenda. Now, in, in the past, we have given consensus on issues and then come back and uh, given the final blessing. But uh, uh, I, I don't disagree that, uh, I, I, you know, having the information out there, um, I think uh, would, would be, um, you know, a good idea and uh, more transparent. I will, um, I, I, I will, I am gonna push back a little bit on the transparency. I mean, all those meetings, all those decisions were made in public. And I'm gonna guess 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, TH reporter was in the room. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you, I don't, you can't force people, uh, to follow an item, um, and, you know, uh, I think we, you know, unfortunately, sometimes uh, we we are um, have to react to negative emails on issues. But uh, I'm looking at the list. I don't recall getting a lot of feedback, positive or negative, uh, uh, on most of those decisions. And uh, but I don't, you know. What, what, if, if your thought of transparency, um, you know, it certainly was it satisfied the legal requirements of a public meeting. I, I don't think you're, um, I don't think you're saying that it wasn't done properly. I'm not. I'm not saying it wasn't done legally or properly. It, it is just that you know, you can zone in on any of the issues here, but um, there are certainly many, many more childcare. Um, is, 
centers who have tremendous issues in today's world. One of them has been contacting me all year, wondering when is the opportunity to apply? And it's not any of those listed right now. We've never got an application from this nonprofit before. So, um, you know, as the, as the story gets told, um, in part because we don't have, you know, um, all agreement on this, it's coming more and more to light that we do this. I think we do need to strategically know why um, we do this and, and to whom and, you know, it, why do we give money every year to some of these organizations? Um, you know, since I've joined the board and we haven't written to some of the groups, they actually haven't, they've missed opportunities to write the grant because they thought it was just automatic. So that, you know, I think we've all talked about this before. And I mean, I think there's, a, you know, I, I think we all have some concerns about giving greater clarity to this part of our budget. Leah, um, was that in? Um, yeah, so, go, go ahead, Supervisor Wickham. Yeah, so I, I you know, please don't characterize all, meaning all supervisors, if you can speak for, for your comments, I'd appreciate it. So, um, you know, I think the purchase of service requests overall um, is is a consistent and uh, common practice for the Board of Supervisors. And you can go back a decade or two and, and find many of these uh, community groups that have received funding um, and why we, why we fund them. If supervisors don't know the answer to that, shame on them. So, you know, I'm familiar with each and every one of these organizations and I believe they, they you know, serve a valuable component to the community. And that's why we're we're using our tax dollars to fund them. Um, you know, the opportunity would be to not fund them. The other opportunity would be to create more government hierarchy and try to offer those services internally. And Dubuque County traditionally has been relatively stingy on adding new full-time employees uh, in areas of government. Um, and so, you know, we don't have the, the health department that other counties have because we outsource that to the VNA. And many of these components, you could consider outsourced service that we're using tax dollars to provide services into the, the community. And I think they're all justifiable at this point, or I wouldn't vote for them. The second piece I think we've talked about a little bit, and maybe we can add some more clarity to is, you know, are they just Dubuque centric or not? And so there's, there's a mix. I think, you know, they lean heavily more towards the, the metro of Dubuque because that's where more social services are probably needed. But if you look at, uh, you know, Creative Adventure Lab, those components were in Dyersville and Cascade, and we fund the fair every year, which is clearly a rule, and, you know, throughout the, the county, which is a, a great, great organization, and, uh, you know, they're very much the fabric of Dubuque County uh, for many, many years, and uh, right at the top of the list, beyond the game, that's, that's all about Dyersville and uh, the Field of Dreams and the uh, Major League Baseball game, um, so... There, there's a good balance. And so uh, I think those are the things um, that, uh, you know, I, I'm feeling good about related to this process. Um, the comment that I think we could do uh, budgets and so put these into departmental budgets, there's probably a few. So, you know, Mercy Health Services, yeah, I clearly think that should be in the health department. So the, the health department, we have a board, we have structure, we have a director, we have an assistant director, you know, and uh, they, easily should be able to, to make those types of decisions. And if for some reason that supervisors would want to add or potentially subtract from their decisions, uh, that would be a, an, an opportunity. Um, but my, my thought at this point, it would be um, unless there is a proposal to change this from a supervisor, we should follow our normal process. Um, normal processes shouldn't just be interrupted because of ideas and discussion. They should be changed because of motions and order and, you know, things that we do that are very transparent. And so while there's a lot of discussion about this until there's a firm proposal and, you know, a firm motion, I, I think we follow the normal process and we release the grant application and we, we go through the same process we have and there'll be a new, you know, two, one additional person at least that will be making uh, these decisions come budget time. Okay. Well, I think uh, we've raised uh, uh, good points, uh, uh, and uh, I think uh, 
uh, both supervisors uh, Wickham and McDonough have made, you know, uh, uh, good points. I think we should always, uh, uh, if if we're going to make a change, make sure that uh, the public is aware of it. Um, and uh, you know, I, I do think that uh, Dubuque County has the uh, three newspapers, and I think they get good coverage on county issues. And uh, uh, so I think, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I do, I'm, I'm trying to not, um, you know, I have a, a month to serve. Uh, uh, we have supervisor like Potoff is in the meeting and I respecting his position and that he'll be involved in this budget uh, discussion. And uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, for, I, I don't think what we've been doing is, is broken. Um, and uh, I think the, I, I would like to see the board, you know, take a look at it. And again, uh, some of these things um, such as uh, uh, what was already previously mentioned, Mercy, um, the um, uh, medication assisted treatment grant, clearly with the health department, uh, the Tom Hancock grant program, um, clearly uh, in the emergency management services budget, um, I think uh, we should be able to we should be able to figure that out. So, um, but uh, not an action item for today. So, um, I think uh, uh, let's look at uh, the information that was provided, and we can come back and talk about this at another meeting. Stella, if you would please email me the two documents that you've produced here. I will do that right away. I will send that to the entire board. Thank you, Stella. So um, the next steps uh, for me in the process will be working with the departments on their departmental budgets. So I'll be getting those out um, in the next week to them and then we'll continue on um, FY22. So you'll see more of me um, in the coming weeks. But uh, this, um, we'll just need to make a decision at some point in the next couple of weeks on whether to publish this application or not. So okay. I'll, I'll be back. Well, I think I'll go back to that. That's been standard practice for my six years in the budget. I think we follow that unless there's direct action from the board. I mean, we don't stop other processes just because we discuss them. I'm so I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to my other supervisors. Um, I don't think I think it's unfair if one supervisor says, well, I have a question and then we stop the, a process that's been going on for decades. That's not the process I would think we would want to adhere to. Well, I, I think it's important to actually have had the documents in advance of the meeting so we could actually read them and have a chance to, to look at them. So, um, you know, let's at least meet again. So we, we will meet again, we meet every Monday. So, you know, I'm, I'm open for change, Supervisor McDonough, but you can't just throw out questions and say, these are all problems with no solutions. I mean, you know, that doesn't help anyone. Uh, so, you know, if we wanna change it, what do we wanna change? And if you're leading it, please do. I'm fine with the process. I think we can move forward with it. I think, I've, you know, so uh, to be in limbo land doesn't doesn't help any of the recipients of these services and or the people that they serve, uh, nor does it help internal staff. So other things that I'd like so to- I, 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 object to, I object to stopping our current, current processes um, because we're talking about this. We, we, you know, we talk about various roads and bridges. We talk about various conservation projects. But we don't stop the whole budget process that we've used for years. And so I don't know why we're doing that now. Well, I have a request for some information for you, Stella. I'd like to know when the first grant was made to each of these groups um, so we can start to see, you know, longevity issues. How many years have we made um, grants to the Four Mounds Foundation, for instance. Um, you know, we should start to actually see some history here the year over year. Uh, I have about I have about 10 years of history, uh, maybe 11 now. 
for okay. us. So provide that. I mean, we'll have to do with what we have. I mean, I think reviewing history and reviewing results is, is right on. Um, so, I mean, I think we want to, you know, always have good oversight and practice. Um, what I'm objecting to is, you know, if we've always, you know, released the grant application around December, that's where we are right now. And I'd ask my colleagues, you know, why are we stopping that process? And, and I object to that. We have uh, taken no action, uh, you know, not to do that, and nor are we going to take action today because it's not on the agenda as an action item. So, um, so, so I what think, does that mean? Precedent stands and, and for normal process stands. What does that mean? I mean, I mean, do you want one supervisor to tell the budget director don't release this on the website? Is that how our government works? No, I don't believe that's how it works. So then if we normally release this in December, that's what we should do. Well, Supervisor Baker has suggested that we actually release some kind of press release to the newspapers. We've never done that before. I mean, the program does warrant some discussion that isn't just literally off the cuff, which is how we always end up addressing this issue. That's certainly not good government, is it? I, and I, I, your characterization. I, I, I just want, you know, if there's consensus to move, I'm fine with that. I'm just not hearing that. And I'm the only one that's been, I think we have two, we have, we have one supervisor, one in one and the other. So I'm clearly saying, let's move forward with the process. Um, you know, staff and the, the community need, they need consensus and direction. If we're going to change, let's make that clear. I, I'm going to comment on uh, some of these that have been around a number of years. Uh, and I, I think, Ann, it might have been in your first year on the board. I asked uh, because uh, uh, one of the organizations um, had, I, I, I did some research and it had been over 10 or 15 years, uh, the Riverview Center. And if you recall, uh, they came in, did a presentation. We hadn't heard from them. So I think. Um, they, you know, maybe thought it was automatic, uh, if you will, came in, did a presentation, and we realized they're providing a, a, a great service uh, for our citizens. And uh, so I think from time to time, uh, we need to do that. And uh, so I, 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 you know, now, um, do we need to bring Riverview Center in every year? Probably not. Uh, you know, if they have changes in their organization, then I think, you know, we need to uh, look at that. And I'm not singling them out. They, you know, I fully support their, uh, their mission and, and Dubuque County uh, providing some support for, for their programs. So um, I, I, I think we have, done the due diligence on this and uh, you know been as transparent as we could I think we could um, you know again uh, maybe make a splash uh, 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 publicly by releasing this I know the uh, DRA uh, they do a press release when their applications are coming out uh, we could do something like that so all right. Anything else on this issue? Uh, yeah, I just need clarity. What? So, what is Stella supposed to 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 change process and not release this on our website? Are we gonna, you know, normally staff would follow the same process they've done for, you know, it's been six years for for my process and budgets. Um, are, are we are we telling her to hold it? I think we need further discussion. So I guess I'm asking that she hold. I'm, I'm saying proceed, Supervisor Baker. Yeah, I, I think in, in this case, we haven't taken any action. We don't know what, we're, what action would be taken. Um, so I don't know what the harm is to release the application uh, at this point. So let's, let's get that out there. So Stella, Continue. what information do you need to know? 
I will release the application. There's no material changes to it this year, um, other than some, you know, dates and formatting. So I'll be putting that out on our website for um, applicants to uh, download and then uh, send back in. So is, are you doing any, any more, um, are we letting people know that the time is open? I mean, if we're doing it like past years, we're doing it kind of secretly. Um, I, 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 I kind of object to secretly and because it's, it's always been done publicly in a public meeting, but uh, I had suggested maybe we do a press release. So um, right, I, I we, would, we I would recommend that we do a, <laughs> I would recommend that we do a, um, a press release similar to the, uh, what the DRA does. If we need uh, information on how they do that, let's contact them. Uh, and, and you're, you're doing something new and Supervisor Wickham doesn't want you to do anything new. <laughs> I, I'm trying to be, uh, trying to get more word out to more groups. I think the incumbent groups organizations are watching this. I think there's others that may not be aware of it. Uh, so, uh, and we can't, I think everybody agrees, at least I hope we do, that it's impossible for us to individually reach out to all organizations because we would more than likely miss some. So I think we gotta make it so that, uh, um, you know, everybody has the same opportunity. Right. So maybe we could have um, Stella prepare a press release for us to see, that, or Ed Raber could do that. Right, and that, that can be done uh, through emails. Uh, um, you know, you know uh, prepare an e uh, a press release, forward it to us individually by email and see if we're okay with it. Stella could do that. We'll, Ed be, could meeting, do that. we'll be meeting Monday. So we'll be yeah. meeting Monday. Yeah. You certainly could approve it on Monday, you know, just to get the documents. You know, I'm sounds like a great idea. You know, anytime we yeah. communicate more to the public, that's that's wonderful. Um, but okay. just supervisors talking about ideas aren't real helpful. Government usually needs documents. And so if we're proposing change, we need to document the change. And those proposing those changes, that that's their responsibility. And so Stella, if you could make sure that you're sending that to us in advance and to let, it, let us know. So we all have the documents and it goes out with the agenda packet. That's clearly vital. Okay, I will get to work. Thank you, Stella. Yep, thank you, everyone. <clears throat> all right, moving on. Next up, um, item D is a work session to discuss the executive director position. And I guess for this, we'll go to Don Sherman. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you just fine. I can. So um, I wanted to have this conversation and it sounds silly, but have the conversation about when we as the, or you as the board would like to have the conversation about this position. So um, just a brief recap. Um, when COVID began and we started to have discussions about adding some resources to help with the county COVID action and also to provide additional resources to you as the board, um, you agreed to hire an interim executive director um, to fulfill those duties. And so we brought Ed on to do that. Um, that employment agreement um, was approved by you through December 31st. Within those discussions at that time, um, there was consensus that you would again have um, discussions about, um, do we, would you like to extend that further? We wanted to kind of see where we were at with specifically COVID, but, but see how you as the board utilize this position as well and to see if there is um, some opportunity of making this a permanent position within Dubuque County and see if there was value to you as the board of having this additional resource to you. So as we start to near the end of that agreement, 
I have started to put together some options for your consideration. But instead of just bringing that to you, I understand, you know, this position would be working with future um, boards. And so I'm, I want to have the discussion with you of, do you want me to bring this as a work session before we, we seat our new supervisor, knowing that it will affect um, future super or boards of supervisors as well. So you as this board can make that decision as a, as a sitting board and you know decide if you would like to make this a permanent position. We'll go over all of the options of how other counties design a similar um, position within within their governments. Um, there's there's several different models out there um, throughout even the state of Iowa that I'd like to present to you for consideration. Or do you want me to wait till we seat the new supervisor before we have that discussion? And, and with that, there would be some implications of where you land on that. There would be another additional discussion about then specifically continuing on and maybe extending that offer, um, that interim offer to Ed, if there's some value in continuing that on for another set term as well. So it, it, again, it sounds silly. I'm having, we want to have a discussion of when we want to have this discussion, but I think it's important. And I know we have Harley on the call too, um, to see when you would like to do that as the board. I guess uh, I'll speak up first. First, I'm not um, I'm certainly not offended, and I think it makes sense to have the uh, ultimate decision made by the uh, new board. But um, at, you know, um, my term goes till December 31st of 2020. I would like to have uh, input um, into this so that my counterparts, uh, supervisors McDonough and Wickham, and supervisor elect pot off, uh, know how I feel about it. Now, that may or may not uh, mean anything to anybody, but, uh, um, you know, so I don't know if today is that day or if, uh, you know, uh, the other thing is um, the new board uh, takes effect uh, January 1st of 2021. Uh, if the agreement is um, with um, Ed Raber uh, for that position uh, ends on December 31st. Um, I don't know that it's fair to uh, say you have to wait, uh, you know, I mean, does he show up for work on December 1st or 2nd, whatever the first business day of the year is? Um, I think some reasonable, um, you know, interim uh, extension or termination, uh, if, if that's how uh, the decision is made uh, uh, that you should know where, you know, um, whether or not to report to work on January 1st. So I'll throw that out there for my counterparts. Uh, and if today is the day to discuss this, I'm prepared to give my input on that. But I wanted to at least have that issue um, out there. So it, it Anne and Jay, I'm interested in hearing from you. Oh, can I just make one comment, Chair Baker, um, about the process? So I'm looking for guidance because it, the decisions would have to take it, would have to have formal action by the board. So if you decide that you would like to make this a permanent position, it would be voted on in the form of a personnel requisition. So that's where the timing of that, would this board before December 1st like, uh, like to have that discussion, have that, um, development of the, the job duties and approve that personnel requisition now or with um, after the, the end of the calendar year. Because you'll be, these will have to take formal actions by the board in forms of a, one, a personnel requisition. If um, you would like to extend the interim first to some date, that again would be another personnel um, requisition that you would approve as the board take formal action on. Okay, and, and I'm going to point out uh, as um, chair, this is there's no action to be taken today. It's a work session to discuss the executive director position. So we will take no action today. So it is a discussion topic. Okay, Don, 
So Don, what you're saying, and maybe you can just provide clarity. So the, the documents that we've agreed on in the past, um, if no action is taken by the Board of Supervisors, uh, what will occur at the end of the month related to this position? So the personnel requisition that you approved was for an interim director position through December 31st of 2020. So if there's no consensus that we would extend that, then that would be um, that position's last day. If there, if you would like to extend that and or continue, you know, again, however you would like to do that, there's there's kind of two different issues. There's the agree the employment agreement with your your current interim, and then there's also another action that would need to be taken. Of do you want to make that permanent? And that would be again looking at that job description. You know, we, we put that together not knowing exactly how you as the board would utilize that position. And so we would want to, to go back and review that and capture um, all of the duties and responsibilities if you would like to make that permanent and then discuss, um, you know, if there would be any type of a, a selection process for that, a recruitment process. And then again, that would be, in, that would ultimately come in, from, um, in front of you as a personnel requisition. But you are correct, Supervisor Wickham. If there's no action this month, that would be the last day for that position. Okay, thank you. And if uh, you recall, when we this was a initially a COVID uh, appointment, when we made the appointment, we didn't know when this thing would end, um, and uh, we did it till. December 31st, but we also said that uh, we would, uh, if we decided to keep the position, we would, you know, have a discussion and, and do a search uh, like uh, you normally would for, uh, for a uh, uh, position of this uh, nature. That was all part of the discussion. I don't think we factored in COVID-19 uh, emergency pandemic uh, going into uh, well into 2021. So that, I think that's the piece we're missing here. And uh, I think the, uh, in, in fairness to the citizens, um, I think the, the new board should make the permanent decision. I'm willing to have input into an interim um, decision um, and uh, Again, um, I will be uh, departing uh, December 31st. So, um, but I do have, you know, I do have input uh, that I want to give for this, uh, uh, this position. And if you recall, I was originally the, um, I was opposed to bringing on uh, a new position. All right, is there any other input on this? I guess if uh, um, there, we're, we're not taking action today, so uh, I'm not getting any uh, uh, feedback at this point from the other uh, supervisors. So uh, um, in, unless, because uh, I, I asked for this to be uh, put on um, and if there is no, um, interest in continuing, I guess, for uh, uh, Supervisors McDonough and Wickham, they simply don't have to say anything. So um, we'll move forward. All right. Um, Can I make, so um, again, I guess I'm looking to, to see if you would like me to bring forth a personnel requisition Again, there's there's two things at play here for your current interim to either extend that beyond December 31st. That would be that's one of your decision points. And then again, if we want to look at this, the possibility of making this a permanent position, if you would like that that personnel requisition in those work sessions to happen in this calendar year or the next, or not at all. 
well, just uh, I think either a week ago or two weeks ago, this this board uh, two to one uh, brought on a full time employee for a custodian for fifty thousand dollars. So we've got a precedent in the short term of uh, adding new personnel, uh, even though there's new supervisors coming on board. Um, I would encourage the board to to make a decision. Um, obviously, no action is a decision. We created those documents. The documents had an end date. It's all good. It's all normal. It was good discussion. Uh, but uh, I believe uh, it would be a good process and procedure to have this current board uh, make a decision related to the, the future position um, of the executive director position that Ed Raver currently has. I think that would be uh, wise. doesn't mean that that can't be changed in, in, in January of 2021, um, but I, I think at least uh, we should make that decision uh, and have those documents in front of us to, to vote on. Um, and my last comment would be that uh, I certainly have uh, found value in uh, Ed Raber's position. I found that he has been very dedicated, very competent, and very responsive to myself and to the citizens of Dubuque County. Okay. In Supervisor my, McDonough, any comments? Yeah, I separate the two things. Um, Ed Raber is a wonderful person and he has done service for the county but the position needs to be discussed and i don't believe we need a director i don't think we are at the level of what we need and i think that had we had time many many months ago to have a full conversation about it we may have come to different conclusions so um and we did decide um, actually, I think Supervisor Wickham and Supervisor Baker decided this would go out for hire on a permanent basis if we decided that we were going to even adopt this model and that certainly we'd be looking at other candidates. Um, we passed on that at, at that time back in March. Um, Supervisor Baker cast this as a COVID hire. Um, that isn't what I wanted. I wanted to make um, a, a decision about the needs of the county and what uh, we might need to hire to get uh, greater achievements and better communication for the citizens. Um, and I don't think we need an executive director um, to do that. I think the, the position I'm looking at is not that level. Um, so it might be more of an administrator model, but it isn't an executive director model. So I think we need to go back and look at any kind of job description um, as to what duties we want to include, what duties we feel we need and, and those that we don't. So um, I'm not sure, Dawn, I'm, I, don't, I am not at the point where we're looking at a personnel requisition. Um, I do think it's important to have supervisor elect Harley Potoff's opinions about these things. And I don't know how he could have them in an education, you know, in an informed way if he didn't have opportunity to work with both the current form and so, I mean, a, a short-term continuation, I think is a smart thing to do. If we think that there's essential services being performed for the county in everyone's best interest. I do think that's, that's there's good value to having the supervisors have um, someone to help coordinate things for us. This is a higher inside our department um, the Board of Supervisors Department. So I think um, Mr. Potoff's essential to knowing that this isn't a, this was not intended to be a permanent hire. So to me that, that indicates we should be holding this over until uh, the new year. So a short term continuation um, contract would be something that I'd be looking at to give um, Mr. Potoff time to experience and see if his, uh, you know, if he feels there's purpose to and what that position might be. Well, I, uh, I wasn't sure where Ann was going, but if we're, I, if, uh, Don, if you said that we, even if it's an interim uh, extension of the interim position, we still need um, a uh, personnel requisition, then I, I would ask that we do that, but only on an interim basis, as Ann had uh, suggested, and and uh, 
I would suggest looking at, you know, the um, uh, with the pandemic, we may be getting into um, issues. Uh, uh, you know, Ed has been extremely helpful with testing and uh, PPE and, and uh, working with the Board of Health and the Board of Supervisors. I would uh, suggest an, that we have uh, an extension till the end of the fiscal year. And then that'll give uh, Supervisor Elect Potoff a chance to figure out if there's value in the position. So I would, if we need a personnel requisition to do that, I would strongly suggest that we go in that direction. And Ann, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's, you may not have put a date on it, but I think that's what you were suggesting. I am suggesting that we extend the current contract until a future date, yes, on an, okay. in, on an interim basis. Okay. Is that enough direction, uh, Don? Yep, I can get those, those documents ready for your action on your next board meeting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Is there any other discussion or input? I think the last thing I would would, would comment is that, uh, you know, since we we're talking about future board members, so, you know, during the budget process, uh, that will be another opportunity for the Board of Supervisors to identify the funding for this position starting July 1. And so you'll have another revision. And if the funding is not approved in our budget, which normally we have got all the way up till mid-March, to, to get done, maybe a little less time, but you've got January and February to, to make those decisions. So the, the current board in 2021 calendar year uh, will be able to, to make adjustments as needed uh, post uh, July 1. That's a good point. Thank you, Supervisor Wickham. Okay, uh, I think we have good direction on that. Um, so we'll move to the next and last item on the, well, not last, next item on the agenda, item E, work session to discuss uh, and potential action on board meetings for December of 2020. And uh, as chair, I did uh, put out a uh, prospective calendar uh, and, and I'll give some background uh, in the long-standing history of, of uh, the Board of Supervisors has been to have the regular meeting on the second Monday uh, of the month of December and to forego the re last regular meeting um, on the fourth Monday because there is automatically an organizational meeting on the first business day of the new year. So instead of having meetings three or four days apart, um, they, um, um, they have always waived that. So the schedule that I put together would continue with our COVID-19 meetings um, on December 7th and de December 14th following the regular meeting and December 21st and December 28th, all at 10 a.m. or thereabouts on the 14th. Um, the regular meeting on the 14th would be at 9 a.m. with the usual um, work sessions uh, uh, surrounding that. Uh, and, and work sessions can be plugged in on any of these COVID-19 meetings uh, as is evidenced by today's meeting. So that was my proposal. And uh, uh, just wanted to see where, uh, where the other supervisors stood with that. I, I think that we're gonna potentially um, see um, an uptick in COVID-19 cases from the amount of travel, uh, based on the amount of travel that was done, people coming and going uh, and uh, uh, I think um, to to not have those meetings would, to me, doesn't make sense. So I turn it. I'd ask for my counterparts for their input. 
In response to your email, I immediately responded to you and indicated that I was fine continuing with the Monday meetings. Okay. Supervisor, yeah, welcome. That, that schedule seems that seems fine. Yeah, I'm comfortable with that. Okay. So, uh, Don, is there any questions on the calendar? No, we'll continue on with those. Um, we just wanted to confirm because we have some potential for some public hearings. And as we need to start developing the those publications, we just want to confirm that that was the intent to keep these Monday meetings. So thank you. And, and I believe initially it was it was brought up uh, and, and it was, um, uh, you know, good foresight from our uh, county auditor, Denise Dolan. Uh, they have uh, some ordinances that are uh, being modified and, and need to be codified. And uh, so in, in I, I think it's only fair that we get our schedule out there for the uh, county auditor and any other department and uh, including the health department uh, um, and, uh, and our citizens, of course. So, um, and I guess uh, because this is a new time and then traditionally we haven't done the late December meeting. I think we should get word out there to the public that we will be meeting all the way through December. Okay, any questions? Uh, it does say potential action. Um, so I, if somebody wanted to put that in the form of a motion, um, I think we can move forward with this. Well, I, I, I will I make propose. a motion to go ahead, Jay. Make a motion to proceed with the December schedule as discussed, which is uh, each Monday in the month of December. Okay. Is there a second? I will second that. Uh, discussion? I'm not sure why we need a motion to do this. We've been doing it's, this since March. It says potential action on it, so. Right, so I don't think we should take action, that's. Okay, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. Aye. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna go back because I said, um, all in favor say aye, and I said aye, then I didn't hear anything. And, and so, I said aye. Sorry. Okay. And then all opposed use the sign of nay. And I'm going to rule that it's carried two to zero. Thank you. Okay. And is there an abstention? Yes. Okay. Two to zero to one. Okay. We're going to public comments. At this time, anyone may address the board on matters of which are of concern to that person and which are not agenda items. Please go to the podium, state your name and home address. Please be aware that the board is limited in their ability to respond to such inquiries and Iowa code prohibits the board from deliberating or acting on items not appearing on the agenda. In this case, uh, I don't know if there's anyone at the, um, in the supervisor's chambers to go to the podium. You can raise your hand uh, or contact us on chat as well. So we'll start that process now. No one has indicated they would like to. Okay, then I believe the appropriate motion would be to recess. So I would entertain a motion to recess. So moved. And I will second that. Motion made and seconded to recess. Any that's non-debatable. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Carry three zero. I have us in recess at eleven thirty-nine a.m. Thank you all and have a great day and be well.